you can declare it at any time, of course. We have a delegation this morning, and I'm going to try to get this right, but Andre Zavorgi, Zavorigin, Zavorigin, all right. He's going to, uh, he has a presentation this morning uh, uh, regarding uh, peak oil and rural transition. And I just, I will remind the speaker, you have 10 minutes. So welcome. And the floor is yours, sir. Greetings in the love and light of the one infinite creator. I'm Andres Horrigan. And today I'm presenting about peak oil and rural transition. Uh, this is Reistat Energy's Global Oil Reserve Outlook. It's one of the most detailed and reliable sources of oil reserve information. And since last year, it's declined by half a year in proven reserves and one and a half years in proven reserves. And we have about eight and a half years remaining uh, if you look at either the proven or the probable and uh, with a range of about five to 16 years. And so uh, what well, Hubert... Uh, predicted it a long time ago, and uh, but he, he predicted a, a, a smaller peak. Uh, however, with the updated metrics, we're still going to have a half peak production in about 2035. And there's a uh, kind of different estimates of how long it'll last. Alberta oil is a good example. Uh, so we peaked production in 1998 in terms of our natural gas and oil uh, for conventional sources. And uh, even though we continued to drill as much as we could, uh, we didn't manage to increase it. Uh, so, so our peak wells was in 2009 and uh, all tar sands are based on uh, natural gas in order to be viable. Uh, U.S. shale is what's currently powering most of the world or most of the growth and production. Uh, but the uh, shale wells are also limited, just like any field. And they're, uh, they have the well spaced at like 100 meters apart now. Uh, so they're cannibalizing production. And uh, in terms of the oil price, some people claim that uh, it, the oil, a, a, as uh, we get less oil, the price will go up and then they'll be able to get the more difficult things. But actually, the oil price is dependent on money supply. And as we know, with high interest rates, the money supply goes down. And so the price of oil goes down. Uh, people are living in tents. They, they can't afford gasoline. Uh, so uh, a limits to growth study was published in the 70s, and uh, it kind of predicted all of this. And uh, so it, it seems like we're right on the money here. Uh, 2015 was our peak net energy with the lowest food prices in the world ever. And since then, they've been rising and increased food insecurity. Uh, now, what will be the future? We're not 100% sure, uh, but uh, some say we'll peak in terms of total liquids, including natural gas liquids by 2027. Uh, some say uh, because of power law distribution, we may have a steep decline. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have enough minerals for a green energy transition. It would take uh, hundreds to thousands of years at the current mining rates to mine enough, and we only have eight left, uh, or 16. Uh, where are we? We're in scarcity industrialism. So EU, uh, since they've sanctioned uh, Russia, they're ahead of the curve. Uh, 55,000 companies have closed in France alone. Uh, they can't even manufacture condoms. Uh, so uh, most of their heavy and medium industry is shutting it out. Um, and so Eroy Basics, uh, basically Eroy for 14 is enough to pay for arts. We had that in the 90s and then enough for it to pay for healthcare. We had that in the 2010s and uh, now uh, we don't have quite enough. And uh, the school system, uh, it's kind of variable and, but we, we may have already lost it some, but it, we need to have enough to pay for truck drivers and farmers in order to maintain our society. Um, and we may cross that boundary in the 2030s. Uh, at which point, if there's no food in the stores, uh, with the governments being in cities, it becomes a difficult proposition to continue. Uh, so Eroy of different renewables are insufficient. Um, and uh, th this coal and gas thing uh, over here, you have to take into account that this was based on a certain time. Uh, now with that, we have less reserves. The Eroys of these numbers are going down. Uh, nuclear, especially thorium, is possible, but uh, we don't have enough reserves uh, to do enough for everybody. Uh, we, we'll, if we were to transition fully to nuclear, we'd only have 10 years of reserves left. Uh, so where are we headed? Uh, salvage economy. So after the scarcity industrialism, we'd be going to salvage economy where people would be living kind of like this, uh, going to cities to collect the scrap, to take them to the rural areas where they can uh, make them into tools and implements. And so the, the, there's four, uh, based on the mass dreams of the future, there's four different lifestyles. So one of them is the, the urban like this, 
Uh, one of them is like living like the Amish. Uh, 56 uh, is the life expectancy because it's very hard. And now there's also, uh, you know, if you go far up north into the northern Ontario, you can live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Uh, it's actually easier than the Amish, and they have a life expectancy of 70. Uh, but then there's also the New Age Sylvan food forest communities, which have a life expectancy of 89 years because uh, all the food is on site. And uh, it's easier to produce since the once the trees are planted and producing, that they, they will produce for tens to hundreds of years. Uh, so this is a summary of what can work. And uh, here, for example, for a family, um, you need to have a one to two hectares per uh, capita. For a family of six, you'd need six to 12 hectares. And these are some possible ways of breaking it down. Uh, optimal farm size based on global data is five to 10 hectares, so 12 to 25 acres. Uh, church of community of 60 would uh, have enough to also support uh, bovine or uh, equine uh, transport like a horse or a cow. Uh, because it, each horse or cow uses as much land as a person. So uh, you, you wouldn't, not every person would be able to have their own horse or cow, uh, but a 60 would. And with a, a village of 360, you could have a biogas facility. So if you all, uh, in terms of the sewage disposal, if they all get their poop together, uh, they'll produce enough biogas uh, to power one van for, uh, say, a weekly trip. Uh, or emergency or something like that for like the paramedics. So, so that would be a, like on the county level. And a neighborhood would also have uh, markets and stores uh, so that they'd be big enough for that, but also could have a bio uh, F F FT process there for uh, biofuels. Like you could make uh, gasoline and diesel and, and things like that. Like one, each neighborhood would specialize in, in one of those. Um, but it, it, it's, it's about 18 liters per ton. Uh, 180 liters per ton that you could produce. So in a uh, city of 55,000, you could have thorium industrial manufacturing and a county would uh, be able to do railroad uh, and communication networks. So uh, on the federal level, the recommendations are uh, freeing up, uh, we have like 87% crown land in Ontario. So freeing that up for 20, uh, 10 to 20 hectare lots. Uh, and then the recommended policy provincial would be to have a land protection act uh, so per capita land ownership would be capped at 10 to 20 hectares in South Ontario and the surplus sold to citizens. Um, and the, 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 can lobby through the AMO or something like that. Uh, so recommended policies for the county would be allowing and encouraging sustainable practices, uh, 30 to 50 meter offset with a hedge to allow for a diversity of uh, lifestyles. Uh, you, you don't have neighbors complaining, also to protect from uh, roving bandits because there's increasing rural crime uh, since people in the city are not able uh, to provide for themselves, uh, county radio, fiber optic, and consider rail. Um, recommended policies municipal to make minimum lot size of a hectare for single person occupancy. Um, is just so that, because if, if they're living there, they should be able to provide for themselves, uh, grow their own food and firewood, and affordable housing and temporary housing permits to enable residents to live on their land while they're building more permanent structures because we have that housing crisis. Um, and it, it encourage formation of community associations such as churches and villages uh, to foster collaboration and resource sharing. And uh, so, well, I, how am I helping? I'm coming over here uh, all the time and I email you guys uh, Friday mornings. Uh, you can check your spam, I don't know. Uh, and then I run an IT business and I've got a, a proof of concept a tree seedling business. So, so I know all the food things, food trees we can grow here. And I go to a local Mennonite church. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Wow. Well, that's great. You went through a lot of stuff there in a hurry. So congratulations. Um, interesting presentation. Are there any questions for Andre? Scott, or Councillor Greg, sorry. That's all right. I get a lot of it. Uh, I just want to thank you for uh, the deputation here today. I, I think uh, there's actually a lot of truth uh, in in your slides, in the information that you put out there, I think humanity, uh, we don't want to address that particularly. We're all about uh, what's good for us right in here and now. Uh, I remember being in high school, uh, it's getting to be longer ago now, and projections at that time in, in geography and sustainability was uh, oil reductions uh, by 2025, 2028. Like those were projections uh, back in the early 90s, and I don't think we're that far off. Uh, we're nowhere close to the the transition um, where we need to be, um, and I don't think we want to address or recognize um, 
the potential outcomes in civilization once we actually hit hit that uh, that point in time where those uh, necessary fuels for our existence uh, are really diminishing. So I think it's great, the emails and the information that you put forward. Um, keep doing it. Uh, the more people that are aware and, and uh, ultimately every piece of plastic that we don't use is the most important uh, contribution that we can make. I, every time I see schools wanting to put air conditioning in because we have seven hot days a year, um, that's the wrong choice. Uh, we have to uh, reduce our energy consumptions in so many ways because um, we can't continue going on the trajectory which uh, we've set forward. So thanks for uh, the presentation today. Thank you, uh, Councillor Greg. Councillor McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Ward. And yeah, thank you for your presentation today. Certainly thought provoking. And we do know that I know they've always said we're, you know, I've growing up as the last barrel oil, nobody will ever be able to afford it, they always say, right? So because it'll be the last one. But I had a tour of the oil sands in Alberta in 2017, and that was a bit of an eye opener. But as I understand, is Alberta has, I think, the third largest reserve, something like that, in the world. But the easy oil is gone. It's the hard oil now that, and so with the tar sands, you have to uh, solidify it, and and uh, plus access is a little harder. And uh, now I understand that there is a pipeline that will be opening up at a, at some point into the uh, west coast, but that's uh, leaving Canada. But uh, certainly, we live a a carbon-based economy for from our heating to our fuels and and we are there is that transitioning starting to happen and you know there are stuff like nuclear and hydrogen and other possibilities but it's not that uh what do you call it the, the super bullet or what do you want to call it so we're but it is it, we do have to keep thinking about uh about and I, I guess the other question is 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 the world's population continues to grow too which you know from a food perspective and uh, I will say that I know a particular large farmer that is looking at um, investment in fur the further north. I was talking to somebody there just when we were down at Roma, past uh, New Liskert into the Cochrane region, and there's an area there that they are looking at opening up for food production. And that's a key thing is feeding the world as well and how that works. But it's still not based on carbon-based fuel that makes that uh, dirt turn over and stuff. So. Anyway, uh, thank you for your presentation, but it says something that we got to keep thinking for our next generation and our grandkids and our great grandkids. And uh, yes, uh, sustainability and, and survival <laughs> is important as well. So thank you. Thank you for that. Any other comments? I'll give you a, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, to respond to Greg's, comment uh so actually um in terms of the waste i think it would be a in because of the salvage economy it would be a good idea to have a local landfill in the county i know we have uh, one in southgate um and because those that would be where uh, a large amount of the uh, future resources are because it's very difficult to uh, say smelt uh, iron ore, especially now that we have depleted most of them, but it's much easier to say go to the scrapyard or the landfill and get, uh, especially scrapyards uh, would be very good because then you could get that metal and then repurpose it for something uh, more useful. Or you could even melt down a lot of different kinds of plastics and then repurpose those. And in terms of uh, the oil situation, so um, in the tar sands, uh, what's important to know is that the EROI of the tar sands is 2.5. So it's not even enough to truck the fuel. Uh, so um, we're using gasoline and diesel to truck the fuel, and we're actually using natural gas in order to get the fuel or the tar out of, to melt it out of the sand. You have to have 10, I'm sorry, five tons of sand and uh, three barrels of water. Uh, and then you have to have enough natural gas to boil those three barrels uh, at, in order to get one barrel of tar sands out of our current tar sands. Um, and so it, it's, uh, but I, I do foresee that we could uh, either rail or uh, waterway uh, that tar sands later in the future for things like plastics if we need it. Uh, and in terms of the population, um, they did have a, a population graph 
in the limits to growth study, and they do foresee it also declining. Uh, now, the mass streams of the future, they uh, with their projections of they projected two thousand five hundred people to the years twenty one hundred to twenty five hundred, and they found that twenty one hundred there was a ninety four percent population decline, and that is consistent with historical uh, collapses such as the uh, Bronze Age collapse when they ran out of tin. Uh, there was also ninety four a ninety four percent a decline in uh, well the rural areas for sure, uh, but then it goes back up in the 23, uh, by 23 to 2500s, it rebounds to like 30%. So that would be several billion instead of around a billion. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Don't see any. So thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate you taking time to uh, come to County Council. Thank you.